Good morning, it's Rosemary Balu here from Art BOP. I'm here to interview Mike Sparkbosch from the Rotorua District Council. He's their community arts advisor. We've got Divart Mater from Art BOP Alternative, our producer director of the Art BOP show, as our technical man this morning. So, good morning, Mark. How lovely to have you here in Mount Monganui. Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks for the opportunity. Great one. Now, just to start our conversation, I was wondering whether you could share with our audience your general background. Okie dokie. Well, uh, don't be fooled by the last name Spiker Bosch. Um, <laughs> I'm very Kiwi. Yeah. Mum's from Murapara. Um, and I'm from a long line of Dutch farmers. So yeah, I was supposed to be a, a, an English teacher, Rosemary, and I painted a mural 20, 25 years ago now uh, on the gateway to our lakes in Rotorua. And it just kind of took off from there, and it actually became a hobby that got out of control. So for the last 20 years, I've been travelling up and down the country, um, overseas a bit, India, States, uh, Australia, living the dream, really, uh, painting trompe l'oeil murals. Can you explain, first of all, what that actually means, and can you tell us whether you've got any formal art training? Okay, uh, well, trompe l'oeil is French for trick the eye. So um, I was very energised and excited, still am, about that genre of painting. It's been around for thousands of years. It's um, painting things so realistic that you feel you can reach out and pick them up. Um, so, you know, there's a few tricks attached to that, colour shifts, maybe uh, bumping up colours and that kind of thing so that you really can fool the senses. And uh, people are really engaged by that, that art form, i found. Would that be like you could paint a door or a window on a wall and it would look so realistic that people would think it's the real thing? Absolutely. Right. And, I mean, you will have seen a lot of chalk art, which seems to uh, be the trend at the moment, and, you know, um, on the ground, uh, anamorphic perspective, so that you feel that, you you know, you, you're going to fall into a chasm or, or that kind of thing. So... That kept me really busy. Um, for the Are last... you doing private commissions with that work or public? Uh, a mixture of the above, really. Um, commercial, public, um, advertising agencies, um, mostly for councils, cities. Uh, that Even kind... at the beginning of your career? Oh, yes. I started off painting landscapes, oh. um, and um, that kept me very busy. But oh, I don't know. I, I needed more challenge with it, really. And trompe l'oeil, uh, the illusion genre, that pulls in portraiture, uh, still life. You know, there, there's um, some perspective issues there. Um, so, you know, the challenge. And, and um, it offers a vehicle to, look, to deliver higher concepts. So we're not just painting Mount Tarawera or the beach. There's a chance to really tell a story. So um, I found that, as I say, people are really engaged by it. Did yeah. you have any formal art training or is this just something that was always you think was always inside you oh well look um once you set a goal you know we're only here a short time i really wanted to be an artist so i went to art school down in christchurch and lasted six months why was that i wasn't learning i have a, I have a feeling <laughs> hey, i just maybe it's that that long line of dutch farmers thing again that practical base um i just felt it was a little bit uh um, ethereal, if you like. Uh, it just, there, there weren't the practical skills that I was after. So I went and played the guitar on the street, actually, mm. for the next six months and learnt a lot more ab about uh, people and life. Uh, so. Can I ask you something that's not to do with your art? While you, that would be busking on the street. Busking. Did you make money doing that? Fantastic money. <laughs> if I, you know, if they ever boot me out of my current position, I'll just go back on the street. Oh. Um, especially when that, you know, this was at a time when the dollar, two dollar coins came in, and so people would reach in their pocket, throw some coins into my guitar case, and go, <gasps> you know, and, and almost want it back because you know it's easily a hundred, hundred fifty dollars an hour. Uh, and as a student, you know, that was... Oh, that's, that's, how can we say this? That's good money. It's great money. <laughs> uh, and of course, I, you know, it's, it's, it's taxable. I, um, no, I, I bust up and down the country uh, for, oh. for about six months anyway. Um, and then it wound up in a band uh, mm. for, for a year. But it wasn't um, a good lifestyle. I, you know, it's, it wasn't as solid as uh, I'd hoped. But you ever wanted to be a rock star when you're 17, 18, right? Yeah, so uh, I could tick that box anyway. 
So this is this you you've you've you're obviously based in Rotorua. How did you go from being busking on the streets of of I beg your pardon Christchurch to living in the general Rotorua area? Well, Rotorua is my hometown. I was born in Rotorua, and um, <clears throat> I went to varsity. I actually ended up getting a, a degree in education philosophy down in Canterbury. And I miss the lakes and the bush. You know, I grew up with the sound of camping. You know, and um, lakes lapping against the shore and trout fishing, and you know, just sort of, I wanted my kids to share. You know, to grow up in that same environment. So, and the best advice I got from um, a, a, an established artist when I was starting out was find a cheap place to live, Mark. That was his advice. So we did. We found a falling down fishing batch at Lake Rotoma, uh, which was an absolute blessing in disguise. You know, um, lovely setting across the road from the lake, uh, nestled in conservation land. Um, so yeah, we have the house and studio there. Very very happy. This is home. You know. Mm. Do you still paint? in what we consider a conventional way within your studio at the moment? Or you don't have time? I w have less time now than I, um, well, especially in the last couple of years, less time now, but uh, absolutely will not put the brush down. I find that I'm able to um, bring, you know, the mural genre uh, in into my role quite a bit now with the, with the Lakes Council. I work with schools a lot. Um, back up uh, at the coalface tomorrow, actually, uh, Mamaku School. I, uh, it's part of the reason I put my hand up for the job is because, you know, um, to survive as an artist, I think, in, in this country anyway, you, you need to have some versatility. And uh, it, it was a full-time living, and I brought up three kids with this. And so that means working with schools or... Um, so what, we, what, we, what we've just moved into is this is the public face of... Mark Spiker Bosch that you're talking about now, not so much you as a personal artist, but how did, would, did at the moment you're the Rotorua District Council Community Arts Advisor, I think that's the new title you've been... And Rotorua Lakes Council. Now. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, we had a, uh, a change. <laughs> they, there, yeah. Change of name. Mm. Um, but did you, before you took on that role, um, and it was previously the Rotorua District Council. How did you get from being an artist at Lake Rotoma to that role? Well, I wasn't actually looking for a job. Um, my daughter, uh, just second daughter, just started university and she was looking for a, uh, a job for the school holidays and she found this position and I got a call one day, um, Dad, I found a job. And I thought, yes, good, good, good. No, for you. <laughs> and I, uh, I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> anyway, I had a look at the job description and thought, hang on a minute. These are the things that really ignite me that I'm doing in my day-to-day -day, um, work here. I just spent two years working with the community of Kauro on uh, eight different mural projects. And How did you get involved in that? Ministry of Justice. Um, I really enjoy working with um, kids. I've seen the lights go on in classrooms for years. So um, we had tremendous success in Kawaro. I got to know every nine, ten-year-old in that part of the world over the next two years. Now I go back there now five, six years later and, Matua Mark! And I'll turn around and these kids have grown up, eh? They, uh, but they don't forget, uh, you know, the experiences we had and just how we revitalised spirits and, and the town itself in Kawaro. So there it was in the job description. All of these things bullet pointed and I thought, hang on a minute, I'm ticking all of these boxes. I thought, right, um, I get to stay home because it's all romantic travelling, um, a lot of travelling, away from home a lot. Well, and where, was that travelling to paint the murals that you were doing? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I'd had some success in Tasmania um, with a mural com international competition over there, three years running, so I was finding that I was getting more and more work in, 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 in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to the States a few times, three or four projects over there in India, and yeah, as I say, uh, up and down the country. And it's 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 all very nice and nice motels and sometimes a council in New South Wales, for example, give me a nice new car if I wanted it and flash hotel, but it's no fun on your own, you know. And so um, I thought, right, I get to stay home. My kids are you know, only got a couple of years. I'll stay home and uh, see if I can't make a more structured contribution to my uh, hometown. Yeah. So 
that got out of control too. Well, just just widening it back a tiny minute. Mm. We've got the job description. What were the qualities they were looking for? If can you remember the little bullet points? I remember <laughs> um, the interview actually, because a lot of people went for this position. Um, what is the greatest strength that you bring um, to us, Mark? And I didn't have to think for a second. And people. Um, as an artist, I'd worked with people from all walks of life, from mongrel mob to captains of industry and, you know, um, uh, councils, all walks of life, actually. And um, I just, I, I, I know that I have an ability to connect with most. Yeah, so that was, um, I think, a, a, a pivotal answer. And can you sum yourself up in one word was the other thing. I thought, well, gee, I didn't see that one coming. Um, solid. Solid, mm -hmm. and um, I, I again point to my um, my background and my ancestry. That long line of Dutch farmers, practical, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, and I, I, I guess I had a reputation through the work I'd done, you know, in the years uh, at Rotorua, a lot of public artwork, and uh, so yeah, there I was, sitting at a desk. Uh, when was this? How long ago? Uh, I've been there two, two and a half years now, so end And of what was your title then? Community Arts Officer. Community Arts Officer, yeah. So aside from, you know, connecting with community and empowering other artists, and I really wanted to share some of the knowledge that I'd, you know, painstakingly won, especially in the beginning. You know, these were tough times, uh, trying to make it as an artist, and I'm glad the kids were little because there were times we had to go and catch a trout or we didn't, you know, have dinner, you know, all these hard luck stories, but it's actually quite true. But Barry Crump said, uh, if you have to rebuild the car along the way, it makes getting there even sweeter. So um, I look back to that hardship, it's character building, Rosemary, character building. So um, yeah, there was the, the community side, so, and also an opportunity to acquire and maintain our public art collection. And you know, two years ago, uh, I knew Rotorua could do better in the public art world. You know, I'd travelled enough. And, I mean, even in Wellington, people say, oh, have you been to Wellington? Have you seen the sculptures? I mean, Rotorua deserves this, you know. We're a tourist town. At one point, the fastest growing city in this country, you know, in the 60s. So um, here was an opportunity to really make that contribution. Because at that time, and I'm thinking of what I've seen happen in Rotorua over the last two and a half years, say, Rotorua had been in a bit of a doldrums, hadn't it? And it's, I suppose its visual appearance had mm, perhaps gone somewhat back onto what it used to be. Well, I think, you know, uh, some of these big box retail, you know, um, they've shifted or taken or torn the heart out of a, a lot of our cities in, in, in the country, and Rotorua is no exception. You know, I often use the expression, there was tumbleweed blowing through town. Uh, we didn't have a particularly bad graffiti problem or anything. It just felt dreary. And I know firsthand how uh, public artwork can lift spirits. And, you know, it, it's um, really, and then it, it, it kind of snowballs. People feel better, then they come back to town and they spend money. Um, yeah, public and art's a huge responsibility. Yeah, and so there, were, there was already public art in Rotorua, and part of your... Um, job description or role was in relation to the existing public art? That's right. Um, well, we have a public art policy that um, obviously is, you know, I, I adhere to and, and develop. And that was probably the, the, the key thing. Um, I'd, ex I'd been working in the States under a scheme called Percent for Arts. So any time a, a building gets put up, and most states and, uh, and places in Europe subscribe to this, if a building goes up 1%, of the total cost of that building goes into a piece of art to adorn it so that we don't just get these concrete structures. We've got um, a chance to give them soul um, and a look and feel. So um, yeah, I was fairly new in the position, but I pitched this. And, uh, oh, so you're responsible for the 1%. The 1%. <laughs> I did a lot of research. Uh, the closest example was Perth. Mm -hmm. I talked to, I know Auckland was uh, developing their public art policy at the time, and I, I chatted with Rob Garrett at length. He, uh, he said, go for it, Mark. And I pitched it, and I said, look, Rotorua deserves this. 
uh, the scariest place on earth when I first was talking to our council, you know, and but I was right, you know, uh, if we want to see some change, some real change, 1% of our uh, capital expenditure annually is not a lot when you look at the gains that can be uh, achieved. And the council accepted that this was a good idea? Yep, so they put it out in the district plan to, to get some community feedback, which um, on the whole was pretty positive. Let's give it a shot. Because um, these, you know, public art does have a price tag. You know, artists don't work for free as much as, uh, as, as some would, would expect. Well, um, there's been the maintenance of public art. There is that too. Well. There is that too, yeah. yeah. So um, now we have a, a, a ring-fenced, annually refreshed fund so that we can do things. Did you get 1% every year? 1%. So you could actually, but you can build up a pool of funding from that 1%? How does the system actually work? Well, whatever's left remaining in that budget at the end of the financial year does not roll over. So we just have a refresh ah. accordingly. And it's a great um, uh, system because it keeps in step with annual uh, capital expenditure, your spending. So, you know, if, if the city's not going to spend as much one year, well, then obviously the public art fund follows suit. So uh, it's responsive. And other cities across the planet have had tremendous success with this, Perth being, the, you know, the closest example to us. Uh, it started in Philadelphia in the 60s. Philadelphia established this 1% fund. So, OK, a $10 million building, you've got $100,000 right, right there to make it look um, superb. And um, and would it be permanent public art, or would it be include things like um, a, an outdoor garden and um, waterfalls and things like that? Well, I guess it depends on uh, individual, you know, cities' public art policies. But yes, we have temporary artworks, um, you know, catered for in our policy, which is anything up to five years, and that also includes community events and. Uh, that kind of thing. So, um, yes, we uh, we were ad hoc. We had an ad hoc approach up until a couple of years ago. And it's this percent for arts budget is about to refresh again for the third time because we can see what's going on. You know, we're getting these things. Every, we've got a lot of projects going on at the yes, moment. Yes, and now one thing, and it may be appropriate to mention it here, in my visits to Rotorua over the years, I've noticed in the last few visits I've made, there's what I describe as a dramatic visual change in the downtown Rotorua area. I've seen murals on the walls, mm -hmm. um, big murals. There's beautiful, beautiful, large um, sculptures. It looks to me as if the street berm gardens have all been changed and restyled. That's I right. mean, the government gardens have always looked amazing, but this is actually, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the actual downtown mm -hmm. shopping area. Absolutely. Um, a lot of murals, you know, an alleyway mural, <clears throat> what does it cost, say five, five k? We didn't have five k before. We had to pass a hat around. And this is, out, this is outside one of our um, leading hotels, the Quest Hotel. I'm just using one example here. Bang. You know, you walk past it and you, you feel good. We're not getting the tagging, the dreary, the drab. Um, all our nooks and crannies are slowly filling up. And we've got a lot of um, refresh of street intersections. We can put a sculpture in there. Uh, Hope Upper Street is next in the next couple of weeks. We've got a green corridor project coming up. <clears throat> Great. We've got some money there that we can dress it and make it look magnificent. I think... Um, We've got some groundbreaking things going on in Rotorua. I, th from what I've seen, I'd agree. Just looking at the bureaucratic side, you're not doing this absolutely on your own. No. no have you got, I hesitate to use the word, is there a <clears throat> committee? I mean, I, I know the business people are very um, keen on refreshing the area. How do you all work together, the business community and the council? It's a great relationship, mm. um, especially in the last um, couple of years. We've got the key stakeholders from the CBD, uh, Mike Steiner at the helm, very passionate um, about Rotorua, as are we. And so we have tremendous relationship there. Um, so as far as it, it, right down to public art selection, you know, we have a, an approach where we've got 
uh, key stakeholders um, and representatives of the wider community able to voice what they want to see um, in the public art realm. And there's a lot of talented and passionate people in council. There really are. Um, I'm not just saying that because I'm working for the organisation, but gee, you know, um, for example, a sculpture trail project, so much support. Can you just elaborate on what the sculpture project, the sculpture walk is? Okay, well, there's a part of the government gardens um, that have been completely left to ruin over the last few decades. It, uh, a little lake surrounded by scrub, it was full of refuse and, and homeless. And after a little investigation, I found out there's a story there in that lake. It was built specifically uh, for patients of the nearby sanatorium as a place of tranquility you know, and, and uh, serenity to help with the healing process. It had been completely um, lost, the story. And as I say, it was an absolute wasteland. Well, that percent for arts policy kicked in. We were able to, uh, it's a beautiful part of the world now. Uh, it's a stone's throw from the CBD. We've put a bridge in, we've had a sculpture symposium, so now it's become uh, a very special um, key activity. For There's Rotorua. a bit of a story about the bridge too, isn't there? Getting the bridge in. That's right. Um, you know, there's a lot of permissions attached to, uh, to anything going on in the government garden, so I just want to acknowledge that support again uh, from heritage places, from iwi, uh, from our stakeholders and council and, and so on. But uh, that bridge was pulled out of Lake Road, uh, just outside the CBD when there was a refresh, and was put in storage. You know, 100 years ago they wanted to put a bridge over that lake, but they'd ran out of um, funding and political will. Well, 100 years later there's a bridge, I couldn't believe it. I measured it up at, at the back of our um, Castle Corp yard, exactly what was asked for 100 years ago. So um, we had the engineers have a look at it and um, got the consents and popped it in. There you go, 100 years later. It was just meant to be. Things fell into place. It's always a good sign, isn't it? Yeah. That's really uh, an example of what you're doing in Rotorua. You're not actually changing the structure of the city, you're not changing the structure of the government gardens, but you're changing its character. Look and feel. Yes. Look and feel. As I say, we can build these concrete boxes, or we can give it some thought at the planning stages, if there's a budget available. To, to It can be so much more in most cases. And we've got some great creative minds um, in Rotorua. And here's an opportunity to flex them. You know. Now, just moving away from the CBD, and I'm aware of the work you've done in the wider Rotorua community because you were one of the featured speakers that are at the incubator organised uh, public art talk. There was a talk <clears throat> at the incubator in the historic village in Tauranga. And... You mentioned and bought um, images of murals that had had community participation in, in the wider area of Rotorua. Could you expand on that? Because I think people would be really interested in the impacts of that. Well, tremendous success, actually. Um, as a muralist, I know only too well um, how that medium can uplift spirits. It's all about participation. So as an example, I would use a, a local shopping complex out in the suburbs, Selwyn Heights. It was covered in graffiti two years ago, and parents were too scared to send their kids down to the dairy to get a litre of milk. So uh, I had a phone call from the police. Mark, what can we do? Uh, OK, let's work with our local schools. And we had a form partnerships, schools, uh, the building owners, the police, council and community. Marvellous. We took on the, the south wall. I worked with special needs kids and we put a mural up there and boom, the whole world changed. That part of the world suddenly looked loved. How did you, how did the community and you as the council representative and facilitator work out, what was the process you used to work out what was going up on the wall and who was going to be doing it? How well, do you do that? Well, uh, we try and offer the opportunity as widely as possible, but working with schools uh, seems to be pivotal because that 
it, you know, it brings in the wider community inherently. You know, you've got parents, obviously. How do you with... decide? No, what I, I suppose what I'm yeah. asking is, mm. how do you get consensus about what kind of image it's going to be? Who, who's? I mean, I can imagine the fish hooks in that mm. of, with people's um, wants and needs could be quite, quite a, quite a thing to sort through. Well, um, the beautiful thing about this is that um, I just pass it over to the kids. So oh. we had four schools in that local area. I worked with Kia Street Special Needs uh, to start with. Went to see them one day, introduced myself, sang a song yep. um, around, and got to know them. And let's, I said, hey, hey, what's special about this part of the world? And they're drawing, they're drawing, they're drawing. I came back a few days later, picked up the drawings. It's heartwarming stuff. So did they actually, that what you're talking about in community murals isn't something you've taken along and said, here, we can paint by numbers and do this. You're actually facilitating what the essence of the community visually in public. Absolutely. I want to pass the ownership as far yeah. as possible to them. I'm just making sure they put more paint on the panels or the wall <laughs> than they do on their clothes. Mm. That degree of intervention is something I've been aware of for a long time. I mean, children don't mind seeing their work presented more professionally, but we don't want to lose that innocence and, and that um, impetus, the thing that drove that initial imagery. So the reaction from wider community is absolutely stunning. After we'd finished the special needs um, wall, members of the community... Uh, Gina actually found the paint she refreshed the entire front of the shopping complex for free and she keeps an eye on the murals which have not been touched it's an absolute um, I think uh, it's a flagship for what's possible when you say not been touched you are saying there's no more graffiti there and who would graffiti that <laughs> artwork I mean there was honour amongst thieves but uh, actually there was one little tag but it was put on as a sign of uh, of, um, of respect, actually, and uh, involvement. In the past, I've, I've painted murals all over the place. Tokoroa, I remember, coming back ready to put a protective coating over a mural I'd done it in, in a public space. And someone had come in during the night and done a beautiful job of, of, a, of just a little embellishment, little little insignia tag. And for me, that was ownership. So I left it right there and sealed it in. It's still there. That's so yeah. cool. We've been talking with Mark Spikerbosch, who's now the Rotorua Lakes Council Community Arts Advisor. We'll be back with him in a moment. We hope you'll come back for the second part of this very interesting insight into the public art development in the Rotorua area and the Bay of Plenty. Thank you. Hey, what's up, guys? This is from Art BOP Alternative and the Art BOP Show. Just wanted to let you know uh, what we have in store for you at the Art BOP YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed already, then um, check out the Art BOP show where we are going to be having uh, regular conversations with the local creatives that make up our community, uh, as well as monthly previews to let you guys know what's going on on the Art BOP website and also promo videos um, with incoming acts that are performing in the BOP, appearing in the BOP, as well as walkthroughs of what's on in local galleries. So please check it out and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Cheers. Hello again, it's Rosemary Barley from Art BOP here with Mark Spikerbosch, the Rotorua Lakes Council Community Arts Advisor. We've been talking about a variety of uh, things with Mark, his earlier life, his uh, coming into art, his busking in Christchurch, how he got the role of uh, the what was then called the Rotorua District Council Community Arts Advisor and his passion for public art. Now we're going to continue this with Mark, and I'm just going to ask, Mark, we were talking uh, before the break about 
the impact with the children's participation in the uh, public art in the wider Rotorua community? And you mentioned the Selwyn Shopping Centre. That's right. Have you had other projects like that where you've um, transformed a little suburban area? I've uh, worked on two or three. I'm, I'm actually working with Mamaku um, School at the moment to uh, give uh, some X factor to their new park and skate park upgrade up there. But probably the biggest project uh, to date would be our airport. Rotorua International Airport looked like a barn. That makes me laugh when I drive past, the, and there's this huge sign, Rotorua. <laughs> yes. I think it's 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 indicative of Rotorua pride. The airport is called the International Airport. It's well, not it the airport, it's the Rotorua International Airport. And it's Rotorua's International <laughs> Airport, not just Rotorua. <laughs> no, of course, um, we're proud of our town, and uh, I have relatives in Queenstown. Um, actually a councillor uh, down there at one point and they laughed at us about our airport because we'd had a, a major upgrade and it did I have to say look a little like a barn but anyway I worked with five schools because I had no budget when I got to council this is my first big project and we painted five huge murals these are all the schools under the flight path you know the, the airport's a big part of the, the kids in Rotokawa school who live and learn yes. opposite and we told their stories on the front of the airport. And uh, I see that they light it up at night. It looks fabulous. It looks fabulous. It looks loved. And uh, aside from colour, there's stories there. So, I mean, those community-based public art solutions, it, it's one of the main reasons I put my hand up for this role. I, I painted murals at Mount Maunganui, uh, must be 10 years ago, uh, for the intermediate school, just locally here. And I'll never forget Billy Joe. Uh, not particularly, say, academic or, or sporting, um, or you know, maybe not so popular, but wow, could she paint? And I put her in the extension group, and guess what? Bay of Plenty Times put her on the front page, um, proud of her mural and a brush in her hands. When we finished at Kia Street, the mural, um, six months ago, a chap in a wheelchair um, rolled up as I was putting the final coats on. The kids had all gone. He goes, you know, there was a guy painting a mural in Mount Maunganui about 10, 15 years ago, <laughs> and I turned around and I said, Billy Joe. And we both had tears in our eyes because it made a huge difference to this little girl's life, and she'll never forget me, and I'd never forget her. Just a special connection. I mean, how about that? And some of the stories I could tell about something. Fonga Marino School, uh, little boy, uh, Rakana, bouncing off the walls, painting the girls, just no attention span. You show me how cool you are, Rakana. Gave him a pot of paint, a brush. I didn't see him for two days. Didn't see him for two days. And this is a little sad, but on the third day, where's Rakana, everybody? Oh, Matua, he's uh, been stood down for threatening the teachers. I thought, wow, you know, I rang the principal and said, what kind of opportunities is Rakana getting in art? Because I'd seen the transformation just like that. Anyway, um, those Excuse are the me, things that fire me up. You're a trained teacher, aren't you? I, I've got an education degree, yes. but uh, no, I, I didn't get as far as the oh. formal qualification there. This is far more exciting than teaching high school English. Well, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, I've got nothing to compare to, but no, no, um, I, I guess I've left uh, a lot of my career anyway up to fate. The things that um, I've been fortunate to have a wide range of experiences out in the field with all walks of life and then suddenly you know you get these little gems and Billy Joe was one of those gems mm -hmm. you know and in Kaurau and and I, I work with schools a lot and you can see you know the kids get a lot out of it and so do communities because it's their children's artwork in the public's you know realm who is going to graffiti or or question um, the validity of, of you know such works. Now, what, going back to that, at the beginning of this um, section, you mentioned Mamaku. Mm. Now, just for the people perhaps out of um, the Bay of Plenty or out of New Zealand, Mamaku is, I would say, a rural settlement. It's high on the Rotorua Plateau. Mm -hmm. You go, you have to turn off the main road to get to Mamaku. There's um, farming, known for its blueberries, and you said that they'd got a skate 
Was that a skate ramp installation? What was it you said about what you were doing there? Uh, the council's just put a huge amount of um, uh, resource into the Mamaku domain. Right. So children's playground, barbecue areas. They got a new skate park, and I worked with the local school up there to to put seven um, mural panels together. Looks fabulous. That's again, it's all their work. You know, it's funny you work with different schools. The kids up there are fantastic. But, you know, you ask for imagery, and in Mamaku, it seems to me that the main road is a big part of their lives. You know, there's the, the road signs, there's trucks, there's even roadkill. You know, I, yeah. I put a squash possum in one of the murals, I had to. You know, it's not my work, it's theirs. I've, I've been through, through, this isn't meant to deter people, I've been through... Mamaku in the middle of winter and it gets quite crisp up there doesn't it oh yes first thing in the morning yes you could the, the heater on my car wouldn't get past cold i had to stop the car get out and put on every item of clothing that i possess mm. but it is it's another unique wonderful new zealand place with its own identity and i'm what i'm interested in is you've said the council has put the money in to develop the domain, that's not just for passers-by, that's actually for the residents. That's for Mamaku. Yes. Yeah. Uh, their number came up. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how those decisions are made, but uh, it was their turn. Yes. And next time it'll be East Side or you know, Otonga or, or whatever. But... So when we're talking about public art in Rotorua, it's not all about what's in it for the main street. It's actually going out to really small places like Mamaku and enriching their lives, or they're almost enriching their own lives, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, the CBD is, is, is very important. Uh, yes. But, you know, people go home at the end of the day. And isn't it nice to drive past Selwyn Heights, for example, now and spirits lift? Huh? So, uh, no, it, um, I'm a community arts advisor and... The richest experience I've had have been with communities. Okay, we get sculptures we commission for the CBD, and it's, it's wonderful, but, you know, here's a chance to tell our stories, you know, the things that... And we are proud in Rotorua, and uh, we do have our, our own stories. You know, we're unique, you know, I'm, as, as every other town has, you know, its own slice of paradise. Well, here's a chance to celebrate, and it's great. The communities um, is where it starts. Can we turn now to something I had some interest in? Going back to the major public artworks that perhaps a council would commission, could you just let us know in general terms perhaps how the process works for Rotorua to commission or obtain or organise some of those really big things that we see in Rotorua now? Sure. Well, it all starts with a call for artists, you know, calls for expressions of interest. We identify a site, get an idea of what sort of budget might be you know, appropriate, and uh, we'll put out a, a pānui, if you like, whether it be locally or nationwide, uh, and we'll ask for submissions, concepts to come in. Uh, we usually allow about a month for that. Uh, sometimes give an indication of budget, just so that we're not wasting anyone's time. <clears throat> right. uh, and then we put a selection committee together to look at these proposals. And as I say, uh, they, the selection committee represents youth, iwi, uh, CBD, um, stakeholders immediately. It might be building owners or, or whatever. Uh, council doesn't get a voice. I am... Your council doesn't get a voice? Nope. That's I can advise, and I prefer it this way, because a lot of the time, you know, this is my fraternity putting in concepts, and I've been on the other side of the fence long enough. Um, I don't really want to get tangled up in all of that, you see. Um, so, no, I, we can advise, and our, same with our uh, iwi liaison officer. No, it's it's community decision. It's it's a, it's a wonderfully transparent and robust mm. And then jobs on. Contracts are sorted. Who, so you have a formal contract process with an artist? Well, we have a short, depending on the, the nature of the project, um, we have a, a, a short form arts contract. It's really just to make sure that the payment schedules are okay and the, you know, things like public liability and all that, you know, just where it's uh, right. relevant. 
And who's responsible for actually constructing public art? Because I've seen some things that it wouldn't be constructed by the artist. They'd need um, a constru- an actual construction team. Well, it, it depends <clears throat> uh, on the project and the artist, but uh, a lot of the time, sure, uh, manufacturers are engaged to you know take care of the conceptual stuff. Um, I find now actually that uh, for you know design or enhancing you know existing infrastructure, a lot of the time it's it can be a pencil drawing that can go to a graphic designer and then go to uh, a, say a sheet metal uh, fabricator and they've got water jet cutters can do the most amazing things in 2015 in art. And the nice thing for me is that I can say, hey, all we need is a pencil drawing, because sometimes those concepts are magic, but the people that have developed them or have, have you know, come up with the, the idea aren't uh, computer savvy or, uh, you know, the, the files and, the, you know, the, it's, it's just too foreign. But, so we're losing opportunity for them and for us. So isn't it wonderful? Technology is on our side. But also what you're saying is that the processes that you have are so open and flexible that if somebody isn't going to present in the information in a certain manner, they won't automatically be excluded. Exactly. That wouldn't be fair. We'd be losing potential as a city. Um, so where that's possible, yes. We'll say, a pencil sketch is fine. You can feed a pencil sketch into a machine and it'll turn into a vector. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a, a technically that savvy, but you can feed these things into a machine, it'll spit out a vector file and bang. You know, you've got something impressive out the other side. It's just like working with kids, um, you know, on a mural in the classroom. You provide the, the tools, you know, you show them a little bit of how it goes, but everyone can participate. Mm. What's the response within the wider rate-paying Rotorua community to what you're doing? Well, I'm pleased to say that the only time a letter's come to me, which has said, as a rate-payer, I think, <laughs> oh, do I want to read this? We are absolutely delighted with the sculpture trail in, the, in this instance. Um, look, how could there be any negativity? Um, Rotorua is really beginning to shine. You know, why would you question... Um, um, any of the process or any of the decisions that are going on, especially in the public uh, domain, you know, the, the area that I'm responsible for. This is everything I'd hoped for, you know. Do, do rate payers themselves actually have to contribute to the public art work? Because you've mentioned your 1%. Mm. The, the, uh, there isn't actually a direct cost to rate payers. It's coming from... How does that, can you explain briefly how we get the 1%? I'll do the best I can. Um, (laughs) Well, every year, obviously, the council um, has capital expenditure, you know, things like roading, um, you know, infrastructure. And it's generally agreed then, at this point in time, that 1% of the cost of putting up, say, a new um, public uh, toilet facility would go into an artwork um, to give it look and feel. So one percent is. So it is one percent of the ratepayers' money for capital expenditure. One percent per annum. Right. No. No. So the com- wider Rotorua community, who are the ratepayers, have seen what's happening, and they don't object. Well, not to me directly. In <laughs> any case, so. Um... Well, it looks like to me, excuse me interrupting Mm, you, again I'm saying from what I've seen, it looks as though in terms of visual and social transformation around Rotorua, the money's being well spent. Well, I think so. Um, 1% of capital expenditure. Mm. Okay, things like roads, they need to be maintained and fixed and other bits and pieces, but in the bigger picture and and pointing and saying, hey, we have a future, a brighter future, um, let's invest in it. Let's invest in it now. 1%. Um, I guess in the beginning there was some reaction from engineers, you know, because they've got, you know, fairly tight constraints. And, you know, we have to be very, very careful. But uh, I think, you know, two years down the track now, uh, our track record, uh, what we're achieving, um, I, I don't sense, uh, well, not that I'm aware of anyway, any opposition to it. Why would you? If you really cared about Rotorua. 
And that, that's something I just want to ask you about. You mentioned you, you are a Rotorua boy. That's right. Yep. Okay. You must have seen a lot of change around the Rotorua. You've seen the peaks and the troughs and... Well, I guess so. Um, a lot of the time I worked away from town. Right. To, to be honest, living at Lake Rotomara wasn't an on a daily basis. Uh, but yeah, I remember, um, you know, as a youngster... Uh, town has come a long way. Uh, it really feels more oh, enlightened, if you like, Rotorua. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, Rotorua deserves this. You know, as I say, we're the fastest growing town in the 60s. There's got to be a reason for that. Do you, we, we've spoken, and I I agree with you about the educational benefits of art and the opportunities it offers perhaps for people who aren't going to succeed in other academic forms and I can see the benefit to the community of the murals but I personally also from a commercial perspective think that public art is something that in commercial terms you can see enhances a town may provide employment and may actually, but by having, I suppose, works or, or an environment that people want to visit and perhaps visit repeatedly. I know you're not a sociologist, but have you noticed there's any change in the Rotorua area in a commercial sense? I think... Uh... That will m- manifest, uh, you know, organically um, as a as a natural progression. I look at, <clears throat> and I'm pointing to Sheffield, Tasmania, and Shimanus in Canada, where the mural art form is seen as an economic development strategy. Population of seven thousand, similar to Kawado. I had the same vision actually. Right, Kawado, let's use the mural art form uh, to lift not only. S- you know, social, um, but economic, uh, you know, indicators. $20 million a year it brings in to Shimanus, $20 million a year. And what I'm saying is that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Kawaro here, because you can bypass Kawaro on the way to the coast or to Whakatani, but why wouldn't you just swing by and have a look at the outdoor gallery, buy a pie and some groceries and, you know. $20 million. Now, is that a town in... That's Shimanus in Canada. Similar thing, forestry town, dying, you know, uh, the mills have all closed. They needed something. and uh, Because for people who perhaps aren't aware, Rotorua was a timber town mm. and a tourism town, but very much economically a timber town. That's right. And now... What you you're saying that looking at the example, the Canadian example, this huge commercial and economic benefit in the public art. Well, if it wasn't for the public art in Shimanus, the town wouldn't exist. It would be Is off the right? map. Yeah. Oh. So Dr. Carl Schultz, who I met in Tasmania, very passionate about the mural um, art form and the economic spin-offs and so on. So he's got a hundred towns across the planet that have subscribed to this model. Now, I'm not saying Rotorua um, should or needs to um, subscribe to this particular model, but it just, it just kind of, it's a narrative to how public art um, can not only bring change from within, but from outside, I think. People are noticing Rotorua. I'm I it. notice Rotorua. Yeah, so <laughs> hey, why don't we just pop over, see what's going on? Yes, and um, although this isn't within your area of, um, I suppose, job description, I just want to mention how the the, the Rotorua um, Art Gallery and Museum that's in the Government Gardens, I've been over there and it's it's actually an impressive day out. An yes. Impre- yes. And when you think that there's that as well as the public art in, in, in the actual town and surrounds... You can actually have an art day out for no money in Rotorua and see the most amazing things. That's right. And and watch this space. Yes. You should see what's on my radar at the moment. Wow. In the next oh. 12 months, we've got some exciting stuff coming up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
one thing that I would like to ask you is, you I know you're passionate about the public art and what's happening in Rotorua. Your personal art, are you having the opportunity to do any artwork yourself that you'd say is your personal artwork now? Well, I, I uh, after 20, 25 years full-time painting, I'm allowed a break, but absolutely, I, I, um, I have a studio purpose built for me, so I'm still painting after hours, but, you know, um, I've got new challenges at the moment, and I'm so fortunate that this role that I've taken on has quite an amount of creativity in it and flexibility, so in many ways it's like a canvas, and... Uh, I don't think the master strokes have been put on yet, you know, it's a work in progress. But no, no, I put my hand up and that requires commitment. And uh, so my art can just sit there for a little while. And uh, as long as I'm making a contribution, a, you know, a healthy contribution, then I'll stay put, yeah. One thing I did want to ask you, because I wrote an article about you in Art BOP, and I wrote that it was a shame that we couldn't clone you. <laughs> and, the, and, and the reason I thought we needed to clone you was not so much because you were an artist, but because of your, what I perceived, your outstanding skill as a communicator and a community consultation and liaison person. Where did you acquire these skills? You mean the communication? Oh, well, well, how did you... I was going to say, how did you learn to talk so much? But <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. I, I won't take that. You're well, very look... articulate and passionate about your role. Yeah, thanks. But um... I, from, from listening to you previously, I'm aware that you have excellent skills in dealing on the ground with community people and listening and engaging with them. Well, Queen Victoria said, be, beware of artists because they mix with all levels of society. I think um, the last 20 years, you know, with the hardships and the character building stuff alongside, um, I've really enjoyed that opportunity. That um, You know, and here, here's another uh, way to shine a light on that is, when I first got to council, I had to present to the uh, councillors. I was trembling. I was absolutely shaking in my boots. I walked in that room uh, and I realised after 10 minutes, hey, these are real people, all there for the same reason as me, you know? They're there to make a difference. They care about our town. And if you're passionate about something, well, gee, you know, where's the, you know, where's... Where's the um, the barriers? There are none. So, you know, I often turn up to present. Well, I turn up to every presentation without notes. Just let it go. And um, I enjoy going through the journey that I've had and how that translates into you know, what I'm doing now. You know, um, it's it's a really nice fit. And you said cloning. That's very kind. Um, it's an unusual uh, situation, I guess. Uh, for, in my case, um, I haven't walked away from a, a, a career as an artist. Um, I just have found a way that uh, I, don't, I can tick some other boxes with it and it can meld it into this role and, you know, work for my town. You know, I, um, I'm still very much me. That's what I like. People have given me the space. I've proven myself on the other side of the fence. I've walked the walk and it just means that when I'm talking to artists or I'm talking to council or anyone in between, uh, I can be me. I don't... Um, have to I think you're selling yourself short because I've had a lot of experience in dealing with people in the community <coughs> and finding out their opinions and I was trained to do that. What I'm really saying is how come you're such a good community consultation person? Well, I guess it's, what is it, hereditary environment? <laughs> I think um, a lot of it's environment, where I've come from. The lights, as I say, I've seen go on in kids in classrooms. Yeah. Those are just magic. You don't think your formal education had anything to do with that? I guess I was a good public speaker at school. Yeah. And active. Why am I not surprised? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh well, if you care about something, it's easy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you, no, I, public speaking was a strength at school. And um, 
acting. I was in a local production, got talked into last year, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's not that I'm putting on any sort of facade, but... Uh, you, you, you expanded your career into acting last year. Absolutely, I represent oh, all tell, artistic okay. genres. We, we're not going to get very far in finding out why you're such an excellent community con- consultation person, so tell me about your acting career. Oh, <laughs> I've been a part of the little theatre in Rotorua oh, uh, wow. for nearly nearly 40 years. Oh. Yeah, I got dragged into there when I was about seven. Got dragged into there. Uh, so, yeah, no, um, I've been in productions pretty much my whole life at school and things like that. A lot of commitment, though. Yes. Yes, a lot of uh, time. I'd forgotten all about that, but a lot of fun, too. You know, um, as I say, I worked as a musician. Um, I, uh, I'm i very practical. I, I represent all genre of art. Um, I've, I've, I've written a book as well, so that connects me with, I think, most genre uh, locally. So, yeah, it's, it's a really nice fit. I, I guess you can see that, you know. Um, I'm happy. I'm doing everything I want to do. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think on that amazing note, we're going to conclude this conversation with Mark Spiker Bosch. He's not just an artist and the community uh, arts advisor for the Rotorua Lakes. As we can see, it's just he's a multi talented person who's involved passionately in the advancement and commu- uh, of both the general and business communities of Rotorua. Look, thank you so much for travelling over here to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Mark. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay.